Uh, welcome to the event. My name is Charles Moore, and I am the director of the Executive MBA Americas program. I'm joined today by two soon-to-be alumni of the national program, uh, Darcy and Julie, and I'm going to just ask them to introduce themselves. Oh my gosh, my slides are going crazy. I'm going to ask them to introduce my uh, themselves, uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what we'll cover today. So how about you start, Darcy, and then we'll go to Julie after that. Yeah, sure. So I'm calling in from uh, Edmonton, Alberta. I work at a refinery just north of, uh, of Edmonton. Uh, yeah, I've been here 10 years, mostly running the, the capital projects program um, and recently kind of moved on to a, an advisory position within the organization. Uh, and yeah, finished up the MBA program in November. Well, the courses anyways. So. <laughs> and I know that you have, uh, we're going to come back to this later, but I know you have a, a, a group project that you're working through. Are you finished that or are you still working on that? Yeah, no, we handed it in on the, the 28th of uh, January, so a couple days before the deadline. So Congratulations. We wrap that up. It's, it's all done and dusted, so uh, yeah, just waiting for convocation now. Fantastic. Thanks, Darcy. Congratulations. And uh, Julie, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Julie Zawazewski. Um, I work as a construction project manager and health and safety manager at my company, which I've been with for 14 years, uh, basically since they started the company. Um, and I'm definitely um, at a point where I'm trying to figure out the next step for me. Uh, throughout the program, I did create a business plan uh, to create my own construction company um, or you know, moving into that more senior level role, overseeing strategy for the company. Um, that's all part of the discussions that I'm having now with senior management. That's great. Thanks for joining, Julie. And I, I'm Charles. I'm the director of the Americas program. We have two executive MBA programs here at Smith, the Americas program and the national program. I work very closely with the director of the national program. Her name is Gloria Sacone, so I'm comfortable answering questions about that program uh, as well. But we have two experts uh, on that program who can uh, give us all of the details of what happens. Uh, if I miss something, Julie and Darcy, please jump in and, and feel free to add that, that uh, context for the national program. Um, and I have uh, over 20 years experience in education, so I'm happy to answer questions more broadly uh, for any of the people on the call. If there are questions beyond an MBA or other types of programs, I'm happy to help out and provide some feedback for that as well. Um, so let's, let's look at what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about motivation, uh, a little bit about the school in general, uh, then look at both the programs, the National and the Americas program, um, and then come back to a Q&A. Um, so I'd like to start by asking questions of Julie and Darcy and asking you to think back probably three or four years ago. Actually, this is, this is maybe we'll start with this question. When did you first start thinking about an executive MBA? Let's start with Julie uh, and then we'll go to Darcy. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I graduated from the architecture program. Um, and when I finished that program, I really felt like I don't know if there would be something to motivate me to ever go back to school. <laughs> it was very grueling. There was a lot of late nights and lack of sleep um, in that undergrad. Uh, over the years, I did always pursue further studies. Um, I did my project management uh, professional designation. I did some classes leading up to that. I also got the lead accreditation. Um, and then on the health and safety side, there's quite a bit of different credentials that I achieved for the company. Um, and, you know, it always sort of floated in the back of my mind. If there's any reason to go back, it was definitely um, an MBA. Um, you know, more and more, I'd say within the last five years is where that thought started uh, looming. And then I did like everyone here attend a session and I got a lot of clarity out of that, that, you know, that makes sense for me to be the ne that next move. Um, and that would sort of bring me to that next level in my career. Mm -hmm. Great. And Darcy, how about you? How long, you know, when did you first start thinking about it? Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm a professional engineer by by background, um, you know, worked in the, the heavy civil and, and then the oil and gas industries. Um, you know, and I, I would say like, you know, for, for engineers, you know, pay is not a driving force for doing the MBA, you know, in, in our in most engineers, you know, uh, position. Um, but, you know, over the years, I've done a lot of self-study. Uh, I have a number of friends who have done this, this particular program, the national program. So I knew people who had done it. I'd seen what they had been through, but I wasn't interested. And, you know, really, it was probably about five months before applying to the program that uh, I was doing some reading and I just kind of felt like I was hitting a bit of a wall in terms of the amount of self-study that I could do um, to, you know, improve, you know, knowledge and, and, and so forth. And uh, yeah, it kind of hit me more like an epiphany. You know what? I think right now is the time to do it. 
And so I just sort of seized the moment, applied and, and went for it. Um, like Julie, you know, I, I've gone through and done my PMP um, and the MBA, it seemed like a, an opportunity to, to sort of diversify a bit. You know, most of my career has been working with um, engineers in, in the project world and the technical world. Um, but again, it's in Edmonton, it's been in heavy civil and oil and gas. And so, you know, the, the national program and, and certainly the, the Queen's Cornell program is a, a huge opportunity to learn a lot more about what's out there in terms of career. Um, I'm, I'm not a specialist. I, I know that and I kind of never want to be a, a specialist. And so the MBA program really provided that opportunity to broaden my horizon. That's great. Well, I think you're the, it's, you both of you have um, slightly different uh, um, time frames from thinking about it, but also similar kind of motivations. You've felt like you've reached a lull in your career and you're thinking about what's the next step. Um, and just speaking to the audience for a minute, I would have to say that that this is very typical for executive MBA students. We we see people who think about this for five, six years, and then they finally make the commitment. And then we see people kind of like Darcy who have decided suddenly that they want to go and pursue this type of thing. Um, so I, I'm sure that uh, our audience, uh, there's a, a big mix of people on there who are, are uh, considering the MBA. And this may be the first time they're getting information and it may, may be the third year or the fourth year that they've attended one of these events. Uh, but regardless, we hope uh, that uh, the audience members will participate and ask lots of questions to Julie and Darcy about their experience as well. Um, so if I can summarize what I heard from both of you, your motivation was really to start to kind of reinvigorate your career and to advance your career. Um, and if we look at some data, we can see that's that's pretty much uh, on target with most of our students. Uh, about 40% are thinking about switching their career. About 40% are thinking about trying to move up within their company or in their industry. And another 20% are thinking about entrepreneurship. So I think uh, that probably covers both of you uh, here. Uh, I highlight this because the motivation becomes really important as you get through the program, halfway through the program, three quarters of the way through the program, I think you're gonna to start to feel really tired. There's a lot that you have to go through to get to that point. And reflecting on why you wanna do this is probably a meaningful exercise. So think about that deeply. Uh, feel free to ask questions about the motivation uh, as, as we go through the, uh, the slides. Uh, but I would really encourage the audience to think uh, clearly about why they wanna do this. Uh, and then these are the types of people that you'll typically see, people thinking about switching their career, advancing or uh, entrepreneurship. Um, I'm gonna talk about, I wanna talk about the specific things that make our programs unique versus the more broad things that you see in typically all executive MBA programs. For example, the curriculum in most programs is, is quite similar. There's a core courses that make up an MBA, things like leadership courses, strategy courses, accounting courses, um, economics courses. Those courses are in almost all MBAs. We have fantastic faculty that will teach those courses. Uh, but I think what makes our program really unique is the team-based environment and our wonderful uh, alumni network. So I'm going to start with Darcy this time. I'd like you to tell us a little oh, bit about your team and how and how you know how you formed and how you started to work together. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean I'm sure some of you, you know, you're you're in this infra session because you know other people who have done MBA programs and, and there's a lot of them around. Um, you know, even in Edmonton, you know, U of A has a has a good program um, and it's it's class based. So the, the team environment, you know, for me, it, it meant a couple of things and some things, you know, you know, like going to these sessions and other things you learn as you're in them, you know, what you'll learn from this session is, you know, there's TV screens, um, you can interact with the, the professor pretty seamlessly by like raising your hand. There's a whole production studio that you'll, you'll see that's in Kingston that, you know, works um, behind the scenes to make this all happen. Um, but for me, the, the team-based learning, one of the great things when you're in class is that you, you can talk and you don't distract the professor. So Julie, I don't know if you guys did this, but you know, as the, the professors are talking, um, you have an opportunity to bounce ideas off of your classmates while still paying attention, right? Um, and, and I thought that was really valuable because you, know, you could sometimes answer questions amongst yourselves or you'd turn out all of you would have the same question. So you feel like, okay, I can put my hand up. This seems like it's a, uh, a, common, um, a common theme here. Uh, the other thing with the, the teams, and I think that I, I learned this, is that when you, when you actually have a high-functioning team, and we had a, uh, I would say we had an all-star team in Edmonton. It was, it was really, really good. Um, but when you, when you actually have a high-functioning team, it's amazing what you can do. And I, I thought that that was a bit of a, a learning, you know, that can be taken back to the real world, that, that putting time and effort into, 
developing teams really does pay off. Um, you know, at the end of the program, I would say probably that there's five of us in Edmonton. You know, we probably felt we could take on anything and figure it out as a team, not because we were experts in those fields, um, but just because you learn how to work with each other. And, and um, yeah, it, it was a fantastic experience. I can't say enough good things about the team environment. That's great. How about you, Julie? How did your team unfold and uh, how did it, uh, how did you organize it? Yeah, I would say um, that was definitely one of the key features of the program that, that drew me in. Um, and our team was just, there's so many different people, different backgrounds. There's something about the way they form these teams that is a little bit of magic. Um, across the board, I feel like most people could say that, that, you know, we come together as a team to Darcy's point, the high performance aspect, they really teach you of how to like manage a team properly. And the real world is all team-based, right? You go into a company, you're working as a team. This is how you want to learn. This is this, this ultimate skill that you do want to come out of, you know, your education that you know how to effectively work as a team. Uh, what I liked a lot about the program is they taught us like, you know, you structure how to properly structure the team. So we had a leader uh, that took on each assignment. And then you had a seconder that supported the leader. Um, oftentimes the leadership role was somebody who wasn't too familiar with the topic. Um, the seconder was more the expert on the topic. And then they supported that leader role. Um, and then the rest of the team, basically the leader would divide the work uh, for the assignment. And then the rest of the team would know what scope of work they had to pull together and then pass that over to the lead. Um, and then the lead would sort of uh, accumulate the whole scope of the project and then submit on behalf of the team. Um, and I really like that structure because you could also plan out assignments ahead of time and figure out who, you know, has capacity to take that on. Um, so that really gives you flexibility, too, because there's going to be stages in the program where your time is, you know, you you can pre-plan knowing I have an audit to submit in December, which I personally did. Um, and, you know, during that month, maybe I take the lead in November instead of December so that, you know, that heavy weight of the, the project is not on my shoulders when I know that I'm going to be stretched thinner for work. So it just really helps balance and even out the workload. Yeah, that's great. That's a really key benefit, I think, for people who join in the program, especially executive MBA students. They're, they tend to be kind of, you know, very uh, busy work lives, very busy social lives. Many people have families or parents who are not well. So there's lots of outside pressures and uh, working effectively in a team can really help smooth out that work like Julie was describing. I've advanced the slide because uh, Darcy was talking about the boardroom and I mean about the um, studio and you can see on this on this slide there's the studio uh, image and so just for to level set the knowledge for everybody our programs are delivered through teams and we have teams um, remote teams but also teams in cities like Darcy was describing in, in Edmonton and we have a facility there where you can go to the facility and then you can see on the screen here uh, in the middle this is what it looks like from our studio so that's Catherine Broman one of our professors teaching uh, and you can can see her uh, looking at the screens where all of the other boardrooms are and then we have the studio in the bottom right corner there's there's a producer and an assistant uh, in the in the studio they're directing the exchange between the professor and the boardroom so what that means is let's say Calgary raises their hand the studio will then put Calgary on the screen to speak live and then when the professor starts to speak he will he or she will fade in and out the Calgary team and put the professor back on uh, what what that um uh, does is one it provides a very polished experience for the for the students and for the people interacting with it but it also prevents that kind of a uh, uh, zoom room you know where everybody starts to speak at the same time then they stop and apologize and they start to speak again and they apologize the having the producer uh, in the back room can really control that and really uh, make it a, a much better experience i think another key thing that we um, want to highlight in the boardrooms is that we record all of these sessions, edit them, and then post them to the uh, to the learner management system uh, after the weekend. Students really really appreciate that because uh, it gives them an opportunity to go back and review uh, the key points or the things that they're interested in, what they're really wanting to learn about. 
Um, so just to be clear, this is a, a team-based program. So about 50 to 60% of your grades will be based on your teamwork uh, and then 40 to 50% based on your um, individual work. It all depends on which class you're in. Um, and uh, that's a, a key differentiator between our program and other programs. I think the other thing that really makes our programs great is the alumni network. And so I know people, when they're joining a program like this through boardrooms or through remote connections, they're always thinking, how am I gonna build relationships and how am I gonna build those connections? So I wanna start with you, Julie, this time and go to Darcy and just hear about your experience networking and how you've made your relationships and how you are keeping in contact. I'm sure your team is one, one level of relationship that you have, but there are more than 80 students in the national program and 140 in the America's program. Like, How did you get to actually build those relationships? Yeah, I mean, we have formed a very strong bond, uh, you know, with my local team. We also I'm, I'm based out of Markham. Um, and then we, you know, with the GTA teams, we've done events with people that are nearby. Uh, sometimes we've invited Ottawa teams if they wanted to come out. Uh, during the program, I did actually move around to different boardrooms that were drivable um, and try and share the experience of being in a different boardroom, networking with that group. Because to Darcy's point earlier, when you're in that classroom setting, a lot of time there's, you know, there's conversations that are happening, people build on ideas. And it's so great to just hear other people's points of view and what they deal with in business. Um, so as much as I could, I, I, you know, I wish I would have gotten the opportunity to go to Darcy's boardroom as well, because I think <laughs> that would have been a really interesting boardroom joy. And we would have also learned a lot there. Um, but as, as much as possible, you know, keeping that connection um, during the program, and then now following the program, um, I am um, the class president of this group. Um, so we're planning virtual events uh, for the group uh, around graduation. We'll be doing, you know, our own type of event or dinner. Uh, looking forward to that. And um, and I've also joined alumni events in Toronto area that have been hosted. Uh, I've, got, I've been to two. Uh, ahead of going internationally to Singapore, I did meet people who had already had the experience of going there. Um, and then they just provided some of their feedback or, you know, just simple things like make sure you do the bike tour of Singapore when you get there. And then I shared it with the class and or just, you know, upcoming assignments, projects, things that were, you know, uh, we're going to be seeing next in the program. It was really interesting to speak with them, connect with them, um, adding them on LinkedIn. Um, and I love going to the alumni events and then also talking to the group that are that are joining the program. The last event I just went to was re-engage in Toronto. And uh, yeah, and then speaking to the people coming in and, and sort of, you know, the expectations um, and sharing, you know, where they're at and, and the experience that I'd gone through. So we all definitely share this bond across the board um, as students of the program. And you really get like this it, really deep connection with different people and throughout all levels of, you know, seniority in business, too, which is really great. You know, we had someone on our team that, you know, is president of a national company and uh, it, 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 you don't feel it when you're in that setting. It's like they actually become your biggest cheerleader and you feel great. It, it empowers you. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's great. Darcy, how about you? How did you build your network? Yeah. Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll say that I'm still suffering the trauma of going through the program, so I don't really want to talk to anyone <laughs> from the program yet. Just joking. Um, you know, I, I think the way the way that you build your network in the program, um, one, the in-class sessions are huge. Uh, they're a fantastic opportunity. And they're a lot of fun. It's sort of like adult camp with a bit more of a purpose. Uh, they were really good. Um, another thing, because of the team's environment, you know, you you do the in-class sessions, you you meet people, and you're going to find there's people you have a, a natural affinity for. But then during class sessions, you've got teams open, you can be chatting. And so what I found is that you're talking in person with your class, and then you're also chatting, you know, to people that you've met, and and you can develop and learn a lot of things. You know, if there's somebody, you know, there's a, an industry you're, you're curious about, you know, be intentional when you have the in-class sessions of like getting to know the people from that industry, and then during the course of the program. You know, if a prop is talking about something, yeah, you just you just ping them. It's pretty seamless, and people interact a lot on Teams. Uh, Julie mentioned the the trip to Singapore. I was there as well. Um, there was the trip to Barcelona as well, and and those are just fantastic opportunities to to be away with people and and to uh, to talk with them. So I guess you know it, it's yet to be seen how how powerful the network is. Um, but you know, I have engaged with a few other people that I I know that were outside of our class but are part of the program in the past. So. 
That's great. And I would encourage everybody on the call to reach out to people who you recognize have completed the program. I'm sure uh, many of them will give you feedback if you're curious to, uh, and you want to ask questions. Um, I think you can see the number on the screen says 26,000. We're probably higher than that now. That's a large number uh, who have graduated from the Smith School of Business. Julie mentioned kind of the seniority of some of our students in the executive MBAs. Of course, there's going to be great um, uh, people in the program with very senior positions. But I think when you start to attend those alumni events as well, you can start to see uh, people who graduated from commerce in uh, you know 79 or 83, and they've moved up to senior positions as well. So there really is a great... Um, uh, commitment you know, within the, the school of business and uh, the Smith School of Business to support the people who have gone through the program. And I encourage both Julie and Darcy to continue to attend those alumni events and, and build your network. We'll be out there trying to uh, connect and uh, hopefully promote uh, that relationship going forward too. I'm going to just dive into some details of the programs to ensure everybody gets the information. Uh, the national program is about 16 months long. You can take it anywhere across Canada. We have uh, boardrooms in different cities, including Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Mississauga, Markham, Toronto, Ottawa, as well as Montreal. Um, we have uh, uh, great uh, uh, projects, courses that are in this program. There's a, an individual project and a, and a team project. We have them in both uh, both courses. So I will maybe ask Julie and Darcy about that in a minute, about their, their individual and team projects. Um, and these, this program, the national program, uh, does an overseas trip uh, as a group. There's Darcy, I think you mentioned both Singapore and uh, Spain. So basically the the uh, members of the group can decide which one which way they want to go. And then they split it into two and then half the group goes to one universe, part of university in one area, one goes to another one. I think this year they're going to uh, Germany and Brazil, I think is where they're destined today. Uh, this program begins in August here in Kingston. So everybody comes to Kingston. We do these on-site sessions, which are really great for networking and really getting to know people in person. And then we do classes all day Friday, half day Saturday, every other weekend, um, as you can see uh, through the schedule. There's another on-site session in Kingston in February. Uh, and then there's, again, uh, on-site um, video conferencing sessions every other weekend uh, where you're in your boardroom or in your remote team and you're connecting with the studio. Uh, and then in October, this is when people are traveling to that partner university. Uh, please note to, for the audience that it's not the entire month that you're traveling. There's two weeks roughly within there that you would be traveling. Um, they just haven't defined the time yet. So this is more of a warning of sometime in October of 2025, you'll be traveling. The Americas program is a dual degree program uh, with Cornell University and Queen's University. So what dual degree means is when you graduate, you'll have a degree from Cornell and a degree from Queen's. Generally speaking, the people who are taking this program have some strong connection to the United States. So they could be working for an American company in Canada, or they could be working for a Canadian company that has significant operations in the United States, or maybe they're in an entrepreneurial venture and they're looking to raise funds in the US or expand their business there. Um, the brand of Cornell is obviously very strong. It's an Ivy League university, top 10 university in the United States. Um, and uh, if you're thinking about establishing your credentials and your bona fides in the US, that uh, degree can really add to your reputation. And likewise, for the students who are from the United States, Smith has a great brand and uh, reputation in Canada. And so if they're thinking about uh, operating in Canada, then this, uh, this degree helps them as well. Because it's a dual degree program, it's a little bit longer. It's 18 months long. There's a few more courses uh, that students have to complete in this program. And we have, have locations uh, across Canada, Chile, Mexico, Peru, and the United States. We have about 140 students uh, in this program every year. And there's some electives that you can take twice throughout the program. Uh, our program has four on-site sessions. Um, you can see in July, there's the June and July is the opening session. We start at Cornell, then we all come up to Kingston uh, together. Then we do our uh, video conferencing weekends on Saturdays and Sundays. Then in December, we go to Toronto. We do a session on um, entrepreneurship in Toronto. And then in uh, April or end of March, early April, we travel to um, New York City, because Cornell has a campus in New York City, and then we're there for a week and focusing on, on strategy. Uh, and then in November of the following year, we spend uh, three or four days in Kingston and then three or four days in Ithaca, which is where Cornell is, is located. The big difference here is that we have four on-site sessions versus three. Ours are a little bit shorter than the, than the uh, national program, uh, but the total days are about the same. And we have our uh, video conferencing sessions on Saturdays and Sundays. 
we do have um, a global business project in our program as well and an uh, individual project. So the individual project is an opportunity for you to really advance your career. This is one of the, if you go back to your motivations and think about switching your career or, or being an entrepreneur or advancing your career, that project is really a great way for you to start that. So if you're thinking about switching the industry, um, this is a great opportunity for you to find a project in a in a targeted industry in the industry you want to go into. Uh, if you're thinking about starting your own business, it's a great idea to do a business plan. And if you're thinking about moving up within your company, it's also another opportunity to kind of stretch your experience and try to do a project in a different area of your company of your of your business. So I'd like to ask Julie and Darcy about their projects, and maybe we'll start with you, Darcy. What was your project, and then on to you, Julie. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, you know, like Charles said, you can do a new venture or a business uh, management consulting project. And because the team project is a consulting project, I chose to do a new venture just to try to get, you know, a variety of, of experience. Um, I'm not sure if anybody on the call is sort of, you know, into the power market, but this is a little over a year ago, I decided to do mine on establishing a, an industrial scale battery storage business. And it, it was kind of just before um, you know, things kind of hit the fan in Alberta. So it, it was really interesting to have built the whole business plan to see Alberta, you know, in a moratorium and now to lift it, but we've got a lot of issues with power and, and then the federal government has also implemented the, the clean fuel standard. Um, so for me, the, the new venture was really interesting because it opens the doors to talk to a lot of people that maybe you would otherwise have difficulty talking to. Um, so, you know, talking to investment bankers, talking to uh, suppliers, you know, I, I was talking to people in China about the project. I was talking to investments and um, investors in, in Calgary, and and then you sort of like people are pretty happy to help you, and so it kind of it's this this trail of I don't know sleuthing that kind of leads you along. But it's a just a fantastic opportunity. So I can't say enough good things about it. It's a hell of a lot of work, and um, <laughs> man, like definitely that was probably maybe the the peak of the stress of the whole program was in the spring of. That year, trying to get that pulled together and, you know, feeling the pinch of being entrepreneurial and not being sure if the numbers were going to work out, if you were actually going to propose a business that that actually had a, a plan. Um, so that, that was a lot of work. And then for the, the team project, um, we, we did a, a sports focused project. Uh, we ended up in Australia meeting with a professional football club in, in Melbourne. Um, so we went from Singapore to to Melbourne for uh, three or four days and met with their executive team there. Um, the The team project is it's it's challenging, right? Because you're working with people across the the country. Um, but you know, Julie alluded to the fact that we work in teams all the time, and and I feel like it is kind of a real world scenario. You don't get to pick your teams all the time, and I think the challenge there is is how do you work in a team environment when I mean, many of us work in a matrix organization, so I would say we often work with people that we don't directly, that don't directly report to us, but we're relying on them for deliverables. And the, the team project is very much like that. Um, you know, it's a good challenge of your, your own will and, and your communication skills and, and that. So it was a good experience, but it was challenging. How about you, Julie? Yeah, uh, so for my project, I did do a uh, new venture as well. Um, I mentioned, you know, I was looking, I had been doing construction management now for 14 years for um, a company out of the GTA. Uh, we do commercial interiors work. My husband um, is a very much a handyman. Um, I've always wanted, you know, to maximize on his skill set. Um, and what I looked into doing was also tying into a personal uh, situation I've been dealing with uh, throughout the program was uh, my mother has Parkinson's and her situation has progressively gotten worse. Um, when we did our residency in Kingston, um, I came back from that and about a week later, she had a really terrible fall uh, down the stairs over 10 steps. Um, and she was hospitalized at a rehabilitation center for eight weeks. Um, and we had to make changes to her home. We had to install the chairlift. We got we had to have a ramp installed, um, the grab bars in her home. And luck, lucky for me, I had my husband to help out with that. Um, there's also a lot of government programs uh, that help assist with it. It's just a ton of research to figure that out along the way. Uh, so it did spark the idea for me to come up with this business proposal 
of doing that type of work for people in the community. So my business plan specialized in the Durham region area. Um, I, you know, did all the research in terms of like the aging population of this area, uh, you know, what, who the customer base would be, what's the probability of launching this business and it being successful. And there is, of course, a need for this um, in the area. So, you know, this out of the program, I have developed this plan that I could tomorrow take to the bank, you know, get funding to, to go with it if that's the direction I decide to go. Um, and also, you know, it was an assessment of like my personal values and and sort of where I want to go with my career. Um, a great thing about the program that I also wanted to highlight is you can do a certificate of social impact. Um, that's on top of the, you know, the the rest of the program requirements. I did apply for that because it directly related to uh, my new venture project. Um, and out of that, you know, I've started volunteering at the local retirement home just to gauge what the decision factor is for people moving into those homes versus staying at home um, and also the needs of the residents there. Um, so it's really sort of brought me into that community of people um, and just I've been loving that experience. And I feel, you know, that that's the direction that I'll probably head in, that I want to help out senior residents and and take, you know, I'm very passionate about that. And I, I want to see where that takes me and where that leads me. But that was the individual project. Did you want me to speak on the global project as well, Charles? Sure, just if you can for a moment, that'd be great. Yeah. So the global project that we did um, was for the Automotive Association of Singapore. Um, they had been losing quite a significant amount of their membership base and they wanted us to come up with some ideas for how they could bring in new members or uh, maintain existing. Um, so we did develop um, a multi-tier membership um, pitch for them uh, just in terms of like bringing in a more elite clientele um, and driving services that, that cater to that. Um, and then we also looked at their current entertainment facilities and doing VR uh, type experiences, uh, racing simulators uh, to draw in some of the younger crowd um, as an entertainment option. And then lastly, we looked at something completely different for them. Uh, we did a boat share service. Um, there is a company that has just started sort of creating different locations internationally. Um, so we pitched that idea that they could, especially somewhere like Singapore, where it's just surrounded by water and it's such an expensive area of the world to own a car or drive a car. Um, so it was to to look at the option of, of boating and offer that to their membership. And the, the client was very excited about that idea. So that yeah, it was a great. great project. It was fantastic. And we had so much fun pulling that together. That's awesome. That's great. So what, when later after people graduate, when we ask them about what did you what do you remember about the program? What did you really take away? We always hear about teams, but we always hear about the projects, too. So I would encourage everybody on the call to start thinking, you know, broadly, what kind of project would you like to do? If you could do anything, what would you invest your time in and, and uh, get some really honest and fair feedback about your business plan or about your, your consulting project from the professors and the other students in the program? It's really a great you know, going through this program is a great safe space to have people provide you with feedback. I think when we're typically, if we're starting a new venture, all of our friends and family are saying how great an idea that is. But, you know, here's an opportunity to have some honest feedback from, from uh, friendly faces in your cohort and to get some critical uh, and important feedback uh, if you're going to pursue a business as well. I'm going to change the tone a little bit here and just uh, focus in on the costs. Uh, the national program is $112,000. The Americas program is about $168,000. Um, uh, full details of our scholarship opportunities and the costs are on our website. We encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, typically, people are financing these programs uh, through lines of credit. Uh, you can borrow from uh, any bank or a credit union that you want, uh, but we highlight RBC here because they're very familiar with our our program, um, and we have a specific code through RBC. So we can uh, definitely provide you with more information about how to meet RBC if you're curious. Um, you can borrow from your RRSP twice uh, to do this because it's a full-time program over two years. And I think you can actually borrow from your partner's uh, RRSP as well. So that's a tax-free 
um, borrowing and then you have to pay it back over a period of years. Um, you'll get a form called the T2202A, which is a tuition tax credit form, and it will help you lower your income tax obligations. Um, and we also recommend corporate sponsorships and uh, scholarship opportunities, which you can see on our website. Regarding the corporate sponsorship, we do have a case for sponsorship that we can provide you, and uh, we can provide you with feedback as well about how to go about asking for funding. Uh, just to be on, to be direct, uh, not everybody gets a corporate sponsorship. In fact, very few people get full corporate, full corporate sponsorship as they go through the program. Uh, but there's no reason why you shouldn't ask, because you may get some. Uh, and even if you don't get any uh, financial contribution, companies may be willing to give you days off, or they may be able to give you additional uh, time while you're going through the program. So it's always very valuable to have that conversation. Uh, before we get to the q and I'm just going to ask uh, Nicole, our application advisor, to come on screen for a moment and just tell us a little bit about the process to apply. Hi, everyone. As Charles mentioned, my name is Nicole Mallory. I'm the application advisor for both the Americas and Ambient National Program. You'll see the process here just on the uh, slideshow. Pretty straightforward. What we look for is resume, official transcripts. We ask for two references, so typically current supervisor and current colleague. Um, and after that's all compiled as well with the application questions that are essay style, we then move to book your interview with the respective program director. So in these cases, it would be either with Charles or Gloria. We do offer rolling admission, which is great, and there's no fee to apply. So we've really tried to remove any barriers. Um, if you ever have any questions about your eligibility or, you know, just someone you need to chat with to maybe gain some confidence in terms of going through with an application, please send me an email. I'm really just here to help and hopefully lessen those doubts, if you will. I just wanted to take a moment too to mention that on our website for both the National and Americas, we have info sessions uh, listed there. So we have an upcoming one about doubts and we also have one that is um, in person. So you'll see there just at the very bottom, um, it looks like Charles has a slide there. So if you have any questions about those or would like to um, RSVP or anything like that, just through me, you're welcome to do that as well. I know my email will be provided at the end of the webinar and I am monitoring the Q&A. So please submit any questions that you have even while um, our panelists are chat chatting, excuse me. So hope to hear from you all. Again, email is, N, uh, is Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E dot Mallory, M-A-L-L-O-R-Y at queensu.ca. Thanks, Nicole. That's great. I think the first uh, thing to highlight just from Nicole's comments is if you really have any questions, feel free to reach out to Nicole. She'll be happy to provide you with feedback. She's really, like she said, really there to help. And we really want to help uh, anybody who is curious about these types of programs. Um, if our program doesn't fit, that's okay as well. We'll, we'll also just share the, the feedback. Um, I think that the important thing also to highlight is that a lot of people qualify because of your experience. And so I, I would encourage you to reach out. I know that uh, when uh, some students, uh, candidates approach these types of webinars, they're very nervous about whether or not they actually meet the criteria or if they have the uh, enough experience to, to complete a, a program like this or to be in this cohort a bit of an imposter syndrome. So we would encourage you just to talk to us directly. We're not going to make you feel bad or insult you. We'll give you honest feedback and we'll help you uh, help you find a bridge. I think that's the important thing is even if you don't qualify today, you may be able to qualify in a year or two with still some, some focus in your in your career. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Q&A. So we invite everybody on the call to um, put information into the Q&A section here, and we'll get to the questions and we'll answer them as we go through it. I'm going to just start it off by asking questions to Darcy and Julie, and why don't we start with, I think I started with Julie last time. I'm trying to rotate in case you haven't noticed, but we'll start with Darcy this time. Darcy, if you could, um, if you could kind of highlight a little bit about your experience in the program, and particularly about the time management. Like, how did you manage this? I think that's something that people are always concerned about, uh, is how do you fit it all in when you're doing this program with your career, with your family, and so on? And then we'll ask the same question to Julie. And while they're answering, I'll look at the questions and come back. Yeah, sure. Uh, good question. I, I made a few notes here that I think I'll cover. So I think like one of the first things um, is to make sure you have alignment with your support network, whether that's a spouse or, or that's, you know, a partner. Um, I mean, I got to honestly say, like, you know, we we started, I started the program with a four-year-old and a six-year-old. Um, <clears throat> and if I didn't have, you know, the, the support of my spouse, it, it would have been very, very difficult. Um, during the interview, you know, Gloria interviewed me and, and one of the questions, you know, and I think maybe it's on the info session or somewhere there, but 
you know, that the expectation that it probably takes about 24 hours a week um, to, to adequately, you know, provide time for the program. Uh, I drive almost an hour each way every day. So I'm up at five o'clock in the morning. Uh, I have long days and it's, it was really hard. And so I, I actually mapped out, you know, every week, like how many hours and, and what does that look like? And another piece of advice, and, and I would also say, you know, if you're looking for advice on the program, find somebody who has a similar life situation because what works for me or works for Julie might not quite work for you. I remember being in an info session and one of the, the people, you know, was like, exercise, it's so important. Like I get out, I still exercise an hour and a half every day. I couldn't do it if I couldn't exercise. And I thought to myself, well, that's that's not even the realm of possibility, right? Like there's gonna be a, an exercise moratorium while I do the program just because of my constraints. Um, but one of the things that, a piece of advice that I was given by somebody who had a family was to set aside family time and just carve that out. Um, like predictability for your family will be really important. You know, your particularly younger kids, like they just don't understand, but if you can get into a habit, um, that was really important. So for us, you know, every every Friday evening was like family time movie night and and it didn't matter uh, what was happening in the program. I always took that off. And I, I think I pretty much 100% of the time succeeded at that, you know, and, and it's also, I think time management is important to um, set that up with your team. So your team knows what your availability is as well. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the most I'll say. And then Julie, I'm sure you've got things to say about that as well. <laughs> That's great feedback, Darcy. Yeah, Julia, let's hear about your experience. Yeah, I, I I mean, to Darcy's point, you know, you do get pulled in a lot of different directions. You know, you really do need the support of your significant other uh, throughout this program. They need to understand that your time is going to be stretched. Um, I did, you know, build in sort of date nights. And um, I, I made sure that we did get that quality time. Um, unlike Darcy, he does have the young kids. I do not, but I, you know, I have my mother that is a dependent. Um, I did get, make arrangements to have in-house uh, PSW support um, where we could, you know, uh, when she needed that, it, it can't all be on you to, to, you know, help out when, People have to understand your time li limitations and they have to work with that. Um, when it comes to friendships and your social circle, I feel like people were quite understanding. Um, big milestones, of course, I would I would make sure that I was there for. Um, but weekends, every other weekend you're in class. Um, so, and then the, the alternate weekends you're doing project work. Um, just to give everyone else a, a sense of uh, commitment, there's also typically a weekly meeting scheduled uh, with your, your home team uh, and with your global team once that project starts up, which is basically after, you know, the February session when we go to Kingston, uh, then there is another weekly meeting. So there's two nights of the week there that you will be meeting with your teams. Um, and then on top of that, there's there's the project work. Some class weekends, we had half day classes. So you we would take advantage of that second half to work together as a team, try and get through assignment work. But you are, I mean, time management is, is critical throughout this program. Um, you just have to balance it out. Um, work demands come. And as I mentioned before, it's important to always just communicate with your team. If you know that the work demands are going to become heavy at different points throughout the year, just let everyone know ahead of time so that you can balance out the work according to that. Yeah, I'll just add, I'll add one more thing, Charles. And, sure. you know, you know, I'll get laughed at because I'm an engineer and I use spreadsheets. Um, <laughs> but but essentially, I, I built out a Gantt chart for the whole program. I mean, you can't know everything that's coming up right away, but, you know, I built this out. And so it would show three months ahead, you know, like what are the classes? What are the assignments? It, it's, yeah, Julie nailed it. It's super critical to be organized and to be on top of it. Um, you know, some questions about travel. There was three of us in my group that traveled a bunch during parts of the program. And so when you're, when you're planning out the leads and seconds and the assignments and that sort of thing, um, Certainly within a team environment, you can juggle some of those things. 
I would say that it's it's quite a bit more difficult if you miss the class time. And uh, if you look on the, the requirements, there's there's a, ma a minimum or maximum um, amount of missed class that's allowed. Um, so, you know, it, it can work, um, but I would say like it, it does get difficult because there's a lot of content that's covered during those, those classes um, that, that really builds on. And, and it, you know, it does probably almost affect your team as much as it would affect you to miss those classes. I also just wanted to add that sometimes it helps to have like, um, like for me personally, um, some Sundays I would designate as library time. I just needed to remove myself from this environment because if I'm at home, I'm, you know, cleaning, I'm doing the bedding, I'm doing the laundry, uh, you, uh, cooking, you get pulled in different directions or my mom would be calling me and saying, come over and see me. Um, sometimes I just needed to take days where I just separated myself from, from home and I just needed to be at the library or whatever, you know, sort of situation that works for you. But I needed those hours like exclusively to studying. So I would do that as well. That's, this is really great feedback. We could almost do, a, I think, a webinar with the two of you about how to manage your time. But I think you hit almost everything that I've I've heard of. The one one thing I didn't hear you mentioned though is that a lot of it, a lot of your time is spent doing readings. And so if you can find a way to multitask readings, I've heard of people using PDF readers, for example, many of our materials are in PDFs. So if you have a PDF reader and you can perhaps do something at the same time, if you're commuting for uh, an hour or 45 minutes, you could, could perhaps have uh, some of the readings going on in the background. Also, the expectations are not that you memorize every reading, but you kind of really drill down into the the key takeaways that you, you're you going to apply to your team and to your teamwork. And so I always recommend redoing a, like a skimming or scanning course or a speed reading course through LinkedIn Learning or Udemy. They're usually free or very cheap. That That's probably going to pay off for you if you do that before you start the program as well. Um, so we have some questions here. I can see uh, there's a question specifically around that attendance uh, that you mentioned, Darcy. So the, the attendance requirement is you have to be uh, active and uh, engaged at the class 75% of the time. And I'm, I'm highlighting those terms because what that threshold means, if you're joining uh, through a remote team or a virtual team, we expect you to have your camera on and for you to be participating in the class. Um, if you are camera, if your camera's off, we may mark you as absent because we don't know what's going on. Of course, we have uh, empathy for people who have specific situations. So there's there's a need for a communication between uh, the administration team and the students as well. But the expectation is that you're going to be there and engage 75% of the time. Um, so if you're in a boardroom, we expect you to be there 75% of the time. Some of the questions were around weekend classes or um, you're not gonna be able to attend it, attend these classes, but I really do wanna stress that you, you have to, to meet the requirement. Those are program policies and requirements. And in order to get the credit, you have to be in the, uh, in the program. Sometimes people ask about the flexibility uh, as well, but I try to stress the difference between convenience and flexibility. So we are a very convenient program. We feel we're, we're convenient, our programs, because of the way we, our programs are structured. You have the uh, video conferencing classes every other weekend. Uh, the national program is Friday and Saturday, and the Americas program is Saturday and Sunday. We have the uh, schedule posted kind of in advance, 24 months in advance, so that you can plan like Darcy was talking. We release our uh, course uh, descriptions and our course syllabi uh, at least 30 days prior to the start of the course. So again, you can plan out each of your assignments and so on. So I feel like all of those items make your life or make your planning as convenient as possible. What we are not is flexible, meaning you don't have the option to kind of con to participate or to not participate. It's a cohort-based program a team-based program. Your teammates are, are counting on you to be there and to do their your part of the work. And they're expecting you to contribute and to uh, work with the planning. So I, I don't, I, maybe I'm too um, pedantic around these two terms, but I want you to, I hope you'll take away that we have a convenient program, but we are not a flexible program. It's a cohort team-based program. And we expect you to make a commitment to your team to, to do that. Um, and another one has asked about, uh, another uh, attendee is asking about team-based projects, but what about exams? So maybe I can just ask uh, Julie and uh, Darcy to talk about the assessments in the program. So what are some of the typical ways that you're assessed as you go through the program? Noting from my perspective that each professor is a little bit different, so they're not always gonna be exactly the same, but what types of assessments did you do, Julie, as you're going through the program? 
Yeah, there was uh, definitely <laughs> some <laughs> lengthy exams uh, in this program. I would say, Darcy, was there three that like, you can think of that were? Yeah, there was, I think, th about three big exams, and then there were some courses that had quizzes. Um, yes. So off the top of my head, economics, finance, and um, uh, Kurt's class. I can't remember what it was. Um, yeah, there's at least there's a three exam. Yeah, one of the accounting classes. Yeah. Um, so I would say like most of the analytic courses have some some form of you know quantitative measurement, which seems apt. You know, whereas the the balance of the classes um, you know have more written assignments and that. And Charles, I mean, I don't know about in the uh, the Americas program, but I, I would say that uh, if you don't have a technical background, probably economics, accounting, finance are probably the classes that people find the most challenging, um, you know, but the profs have been really helpful. I, I mean, I can't say enough good things about the profs in the national program and, and their ability to work with students. And, and again, you're in a team environment. And uh, if you lean on that team environment, it's, you, know, you can get a lot done and you can learn a lot. Well, there's definitely members of the team that had more of an analytics background, so they helped explain, you know, certain concepts to me in a different way. Um, yeah, you can always go to the profs, absolutely, uh, to further explain, you know, questions as you're working through them. Um, but it's really helpful to have people as well on your team that might explain it to you in a different way that all of a sudden, oh, yeah, okay, I, I get it now. I understand um, how to work through and solve this problem. Um, I did find those exams quite challenging um, and some of them were quite lengthy for me. Um, they ran them where you know you, you do your own study time. Um, it's good to always keep up with the questions that they will post you know, following each class. Make sure you stay on top of that so that you don't fall so far behind and then have to crunch ahead of an exam. Um, they pace it out nicely. Uh, and then when you, you have class time, then you can address things that you're not understanding um, and how to work through the solutions. Um, but some of the exams for sure, you know, they were open for a five hour period and I may have needed that full five hours to get through it. Um, it was quite challenging, but I was so proud of myself. I have to say at the end of those exams, I said, you know, I feel like there's no exam that I can't do now that I've gone through this. <laughs> so that in terms of exams, you know, there's those three ones that we did in in the national program. Um, and then there's individual component, uh, individual projects for each class. And you do have to pass each individual component to, to pass the class as well. So there are certain reports that need to be submitted um, and papers um, and sometimes like working through math solutions as well. Those are great. Um, some of the other projects we do would be um, pitches or presentations. There's uh, cases sometimes that come up where teams or individuals are working on cases. Um, and then quizzes that Darcy mentioned, uh, you can see that in some of the um, more quantitative courses like economics where there tends to be, and to maybe the um, uh, business decision models, the statistics course, there tends to be two or three quizzes. And the reason the professors are designing that is because to Julie's point, you don't, we don't, they don't want you to miss part of it and then trying to be kind of forced to the next one. We they really hope that you'll take the time to kind of uh, build your base knowledge as you go through those courses. Um, so there's a question about ROI, return on investment. Um, it's a little bit early to ask Darcy and Julie about the return on investment because they're still doing the, yeah. doing, doing the program. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I can uh, speak to some of the statistics. You, if you one source of information that we could recommend is Financial Times. And so the Financial Times EMB rankings, they do survey our students three years after graduation. And this is kind of a standard uh, for EMBA rankings. And they'll, um, uh, the good thing about it is it's direct from Financial Times to the student. So it's, it's there's no way for the schools or universities to try to manipulate the information. Um, so it's it's a good source of information. I think if you look in there, you'll see the America's program um, that our graduates have the highest salary three years post-graduation in Canada. And I believe last year, the national program had the highest Delta and the best were the best for career advancement in Canada. So without question, we are very competitive in rankings um, and we encourage you to take a look at that. The slide mentioned three to five years, that's based on the data we get from RBC. So they can see how quickly people are paying it back uh, as well. 
Um, but beyond kind of the financial metrics and, and for whoever is asking this question, I'd be happy to take you uh, through that uh, in more detail on a one-to-one -one conversation. But beyond that, um, the financial metrics, Julie and Darcy, what are you taking away? Like, what do you feel like you've, what, is, what has changed about you uh, from before you started the program to, to now? We'll start with Darcy. Yeah, sure. And I'll just touch on the ROI really, really quick, just to say that I think that that's something that is very individual. And it really depends on a from like from where to what, you know, scenario. It depends on your undergrad, your industry, that sort of thing. So, you know, I'm probably an outlier where my salary hasn't changed. I don't expect it to change. Um, but that's not why I took the program. So I think that, you know, when you when you think of that, you have to sort of evaluate that for yourself and kind of know like where you're at now and where you want to be. Um, what is the most valuable thing? Uh, I mean, it, it sounds it sounds funny. Um, don't think that I... I lacked confidence before the program, but I would certainly say I had a sense of confidence and still, um, particularly as it, when it comes to, you know, working with our, our finance people, some of our commercial people, um, you know, learning to speak the language of other people on your team has been a, a really huge piece um, because speaking the language, it, it creates credibility. I think there's no doubt about that. If I'm using like jumbled up words and I don't know and I'm thinking that that thingy and that, you know, that stuff that does this, it, it doesn't instill a, a sense of confidence. So I think having that vernacular um, and, and being able to, to speak that, that's been a really important part. And then, you know, just one, one highlight for the program for me was actually the, uh, the global strategy program. You know, it was really interesting, uh, fantastic prop that we had on the national program, um, learning about, you know, multinational corporations, about you know, global integration of trade. Uh, that was just super interesting to me. So I really enjoyed that, that course. Uh, and the case studies, actually, yeah, the case studies are awesome. Um, I think probably every course I probably made a comment about more case studies would be better. Um, <laughs> but the case studies are, are fantastic way of learning. That's great. And Julie, how about you? Um, I mean, exactly, you know, the, the word that came to mind right away, just like to Darcy's point is, the confidence aspect um, and empowerment, I'd say empowerment as well. Um, but you definitely walk into meetings um, just kind of with a different point of view. And as you're going through the program, you can directly apply that into what is happening in the company that you work for. Um, as an example, uh, at the company that I'm with, um, I know that they're sort of looking into succession planning. Um, and then, you know, there's definitely like things that I, I worked on in the program as a company assessment that I was able to provide some feedback and share some ideas with them, um, which, you know, they really heard um, and they really appreciated getting that from me. Um, and then building my business plan. I'm so proud of what I've put together for that. Um, and then also working with the client in Singapore and providing them with some ideas. Um, I mentioned to you, Charles, before the call, once we all came live, um, our client is doing a leadership camp soon with all the senior um, le leadership group. And they will be bringing the consult, the, the proposal that we gave them, the report, um, and pitching some of those, those ideas to their team and having a thorough discussion about it of, you know, if they're going to implement any of these ideas. So it just is a very rewarding experience overall. Um, that's sort of a key takeaway for me. That's great. Well, we're out of time. So uh, if mm -hmm. we didn't get to your question, please reach out to Nicole and we'll uh, follow up with you for the information. I'd just like to say a heartfelt thank you to Darcy and Julie for joining. It was great to hear your feedback and hear about your experience. I know that the participants on the call have gained a lot from, from hearing from you and uh, we hope to see you at graduation in a few months. So mm -hmm. thanks everyone. Have a great day. Goodbye.